All right, so good morning, everyone. Welcome to Tuesday. How's everything? Better than yesterday? Is Monday always a hard start? Yeah, for me, it's okay for me too. I like my weekends. Um, so Ayushi's here, good morning Ayushi. Uh, Ananda's here, good morning to you. Kevin's here, good morning Kevin. Um, so, 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 today we'll do a couple of things. We'll just quickly review what we talked about re-League of Nations yesterday, and then we will um, talk a little bit about the influ influenza epidemic or pandemic of 1918, not 1917, as Donald Trump likes to say, but it's, it's 1918, proven historical fact. Um, um, Michaela's here too. Good morning, Michaela. Um, 1918, we'll talk about that. And then we'll dig, I think we, you know, given we are in the middle of a pandemic and given that they are not very common historical events, we should probably just spend a, just a little more time on it. So I have an article for you to read a little bit later that talks about, it's actually full of, <clears throat> there's a lot of pages in it, but most of them are pictures, so that's good. So it has some primary sources that have to do with, um, the, the photos are primary sources and then the rest of the article is a secondary source, but it talks about the influenza epide epidemic in Canada in 1918 and how people were kind of coping with it at the time. And then we can talk about the pandemic that we are currently in in Canada and how we're coping with it and um, maybe if, if we can learn any lessons from the one in 1918, okay? Um, so Shania is here too. Good morning. Good morning, Mike. Good morning. And Shamimu is here. Good morning to you as well. Um, okay, so let's, let's get my face off the screen and go into this. So yesterday we read this section of the textbook and we answered those questions, except we didn't answer number six because I didn't tell you to read far enough to answer number six, so we'll deal with that in due course. Um, but we did talk about the League of Nations, right? Formed at the end of World War I. Um, comes out of the Treaty of Versailles. It's one of Woodrow Wilson's 14 points. Um, he makes that speech to Congress about his 14 points for um, the proposing the United States war aims, right? And so when he goes to negotiate the Treaty of Versailles, he's one of the, the big guys at the table, and so he gets it put in. And we said that um, it's kind of the first international cooperative organization of its kind. Um, but it has kind of a mixed record, right? We said it had some successes, but it has some pretty significant failures too. And we'll probably talk about those failures tomorrow. Um, we didn't quite get to them, the incident in Manchuria and then um, the one in Ethiopia. So we'll talk about those a little bit tomorrow before heading into, hmm, are we gonna talk a little more about the 1920s or are we gonna head into Germany? We might just head into Germany, I think at that point. Um, I had a documentary for you to view on the 1920s, but I think it's very, <sighs> it's very American centric and I think it might be just a little too long for us to watch. Um, it's interesting though. Um, okay, so we talked about the League of Nations and we said that it was formed in order to ensure that there wasn't another sort of Global might be a, a little too much to say, but another massive conflict like we saw in World War I, and some people speculated that, oh, maybe we could put an end to war forever. <laughs> Whoops. Not, not quite, right? Not quite. Um, we've had a few since then. Um, but it, you know, it's, a, it's a noble goal, um, and so the League of Nations was, of course, created, but we said it was it's ultimately going to be a failure, and so it's created around 1919, but by kind of the early 1930s, it is mm, kind of falling apart and, and not working very well. And definitely by the time we get to World War II, it is inoperable, right? Um, and we said that it was probably ultimately a failure because membership was voluntary and some countries chose not to, um, not to participate, right? Most notably the, the United States who was at the time, a big, powerful country, a rich country, an emerging global superpower, but 
again, I've mentioned that this isn't the U.S. that we know. This is a U.S. that is kind of isolationist and wants to mind its own business and, you know, let Europe deal with European problems. You know, don't bother us kind of thing. We're, we're over here making money living the American dream, right? So that's what's going on at that time. Um, again, we said that Germany and the Soviet Union originally aren't members of the League of Nations. They'll join later on, um, but they'll also leave later on, right? I think the I think Germany leaves um, on purpose, and I think the Soviet Union gets kicked out, if I remember. Um, but either way, they're they're out. Um, we said that they had to. Uh, good morning, Ryan. Um, we said that votes had to pass um, unanimously, right? So it had to be a hundred percent yes in order to pass that particular action. And of course, that's a little bit unreasonable. Nobody ever votes 100% yes for anything. And if they do, it's a pretty, you, you almost don't need to vote on it, right? It's a, pretty, it's a pretty obvious thing, you know? Should we, you know, should we nuke North Korea and kill everybody in there? Obviously no, right? That's not a good thing to do. And so, again, if you have to put these things to a vote, usually it's because people have differing ideas and you need to figure out what the decision should be. And here in the, the League of Nations, it doesn't quite, it's just not it's just not reasonable to get everyone to agree on anything at all um, and finally we said that nations were unwilling to give up their sovereignty right in order for this to work people have to agree to listen to the league of nations so when the league of Nations tells you hey you stop invading your next door neighbor's country or stop building up your military you have to be willing to listen to them right and if you're not willing to listen to them they have to be able to do something about it. But as Amanda pointed out yesterday, they don't actually have an army, so they can't actually make anyone do anything at all. So if people don't choose to listen to them, and they can't make anyone listen to them, no power, right? They've got no teeth. Uh, and so eventually we see this kind of League of Nations thing fall apart. Um, and then we moved on to influenza ep uh, la, 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 epidemic. That's a difficult word to say for some reason. Um, as, the t as of the time that this was written, uh, it was the deadliest in history. I don't know if we're currently living in the deadliest one or not. Um, but you can clearly see there's a huge number of infections, right? 500 million. And I pulled up, um, I pulled up some stats on the coronavirus epidemic yesterday, and I closed that window, but I'm just gonna do it right now so that I can refer to it. Um, so as of, as the Globe and Mail reports here, um, as the Globe and Mail reports, we are, so we're at 30, we're at 31 million cases worldwide. So as opposed to 500 million, so clearly not, not as widespread as um, Spanish influenza. We've had a little under a million deaths so far um, as the statistics report. So clearly coronavirus is not nearly as large as influenza epidemic was, right? Um, there's a couple of competing theories about where the influenza virus came from in 1918. Um, as you can see, the first recorded case is in an army base in Kansas. Did I put that in? No, I didn't. It was an army base in Kansas, apparently, where the first one was, um, where the first case was noted. But then some soldiers went over to Europe and spread it over there. But there's also some other hypotheses that it originated in other parts of the world, too. And, of course, the contact tracing was non-existent at the time and so nobody's 100 percent sure where the virus originally came from um, but it's no um, you know to, to no avail this uh, influenza virus spread around the world many many people became infected many many people died right and we we you as you'll read about you'll read about many of the same things that we're kind of living through now right people are asked to stay home people are asked to wear masks People are, um, uh, you know, large gatherings are prohibited. Um, you know, so, so lots of the same things we see today, we saw 100 years ago. Um, 
with this influenza pandemic. Um, of course, one of the questions that got asked yesterday was um, how the influenza virus actually kills people. Uh, and so again, it's, it's a respiratory system virus, as is the coronavirus, although the flu and coronavirus are not the same thing, obviously. Um, the flu is transmitted in a similar way as coronavirus, of course. Um, and often people who get influenza, they, they can die of dehydration, they can die of other infections, they can get pneumonia as a result. And so, um, and interestingly, uh, I was reading yesterday, doctors at the time were prescribing aspirin to treat the influenza virus because they didn't know right and 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 which is interesting because this is the same thing we saw with coronavirus right people didn't really know what it was and so doctors were um, suggesting other types of medication that might help right and so there was that whole hydroxychloroquine thing that donald trump was talking about because initially doctors were thinking well maybe it will help right and of course Subsequent tests had shown that actually it doesn't help. It's not a good idea to take it at all. Um, but doctors will suggest what they think will work in terms of medicines that already exist. So at the time, doctors were suggesting that you take aspirin. But some doctors were prescribing up to 30 grams of aspirin a day. Um, nowadays, we know that uh, anything more than 4 grams is too much. So people were taking a lot of aspirin. Uh, and actually dying from aspirin poisoning. So there's all kinds of things. There's, there's an influenza virus, and then there's other complications as well, right? Pneumonia, bacterial infections, and doctors who are prescribing way too much medication. Yeah, but it's 100 years ago, right? Um, uh, Rafine is here. Also, good morning to you. Um, right, so we, oh no. So we, can we go to that, um, can we go back to that page that I, um, that we talked about yesterday? So remember it's in, um, it's in Microsoft Teams in files and I'm just going to pull it up really quickly because there was questions on there that we did not, did not get to. Mohammed, did I add you to Microsoft Teams? I did? Okay. Um, the wrong team. Where is it now? There it is. Okay. Right. So the textbook asked us. Um, textbook asked us a couple of questions that probably it didn't answer, right, about why, why, the, why, the, influenza, la, 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 why the influenza virus was uh, lethal to humans. They didn't really answer that. How do we, what is the, the remedy for in influenza today? So if, if you get the flu, the, the regular flu, what's the, what's the remedy for that usually? What do they tell you to do? What do you do? Quarantine. What? Quarantine. Quarantine? Yeah. So yeah. So definitely stay away from others, right? If you have the flu, don't come around and spread it to everyone. That's nobody. You don't make friends giving people the flu, right? Uh, um, yeah. So currently, not f not for Spanish influenza because it's not around anymore. But there's other strains of influenza going around, right? And so every, every year people get the flu. Has anyone had the flu? Normal flu. Yeah, yeah, I've had one. Um, not, uh, not fun, right? No, much, much worse than a cold. Um, yeah, lots of people get the flu every year. Um, we're entering into flu season, right? Um, the fall and winter tends to be flu season, so um, I guess we'll see this year. Lots of people are washing their hands and wearing masks, so maybe fewer people will get the flu this year than normal, but um, I guess we'll find out. Um, yeah, so if you get the flu, you should 
quarantine, what else should you do? Consult the doctor, maybe, yeah. What was that? Medicine, yeah, what kind of medicine? If the doctor, yeah, if the doctor gives you one. Sometimes Ayushi points out, sometimes they'll prescribe antibiotics, which I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure if those, yeah, I'm not sure if those really work, but sometimes doctors prescribe antibiotics when they really shouldn't, but sometimes that's what you, sometimes that's what you get, right? Uh, oh, for secondary infections, so. There we go. Yeah, if you have a secondary infection, they may prescribe an antibiotic, that's good. Um, what else did they tell you? Lots of fluids, right? Because you can get dehydrated, especially if you're throwing up or if stuff is coming out the other end, right? They tell you to drink a lot of fluids to stay hydrated and usually just kind of stay in bed, right? Take your medicine, stay in bed, drink fluids, maybe chicken soup. Do people give you when you're sick? What's, what's, the, what's, what's the dish that people give you when you're sick at home? In the West here, it's chicken soup. That's kind of the stereotypical thing, but nobody's ever brought me chicken soup, but maybe one day. Not chicken soup? Some? Okay. Okay. Hopefully, I, hopefully that won't happen. Yeah. Some kind of soup, though, right? Maybe not chicken, but something, something warm, right? Something nourishing. Um, I'm not sure if you remember this, but why was the mortality rate so high in Europe in the period of 1918 to 1920? Yeah. Yeah. So. You have, right at the end of the war, you have lots of people who have been fighting for a long time. They've been fighting in trenches. They might have pre-existing health conditions. They might be malnourished. They might be fighting some sort of other infection from wading around in the trenches. Um, what else? What else is going on in that period in Europe? Well, that's what's going on, but what are the other conditions that might have led to higher infection rates or higher um, mortality? Yeah, so there's definitely fewer doctors around than there are today. And, and you could probably even say that medicine wasn't as far advanced, right? So here, you know, here in 2020, the coronavirus appeared, and within a month we had sort of sequenced its DNA, right? Doesn't mean we know how to fix it yet, but we, we have a lot more visibility on what it is. But technology and medical science wasn't really where it, where it is today, right? What else? Right. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of people going home. Right. The war is over. Yay! Time to go home. Everyone crams onto boats and trucks and buses and trains, trying to get back to their loved ones. Right. And so, a you have a bunch of people squished together, not physically distancing. That's bad. But you also have people moving around the globe. Right. So you have this thing spreading out from Europe into North America to other countries because so many people are traveling at the end of the war trying to get, trying to get home, right? Um, what about India and Asia? Why do, you think it was, why do you think the mortality rate was so high there? What's that? Right, so those are, those are parts of the world with much higher populations, right? Probably, probably me medical science is not quite as advanced, although you, could, you might want to make an argument about Western medicine versus Eastern medicine, which I won't get into. Um, I, I certainly don't mean to imply Eastern medicine is illegitimate, so, um, but some people might argue that. 
Um, number four was what, st what stopped the virus? So here we are in 2020, hoping for a vaccine or <clears throat> waiting for a vaccine because the virus didn't just disappear in April like President Trump said it would. So that's too bad. It's the one, it's the one time I was hoping he was right. Um, so w where, what happened with this influenza virus? Just disappeared. Hmm. It's kind of odd, isn't it? just disappeared how did it how did it just disappear does it say doesn't say do you know anything about it how the how a virus might just disappear biology people well you're ha you're part right you're partly right um, yeah so what Okay. <coughs> I remember reading that there was like we adapt to We adapt? Or the virus does? Something adapts to the new situation and the natural situation. Right. So it could be in some cases people become more immune, right? Sometimes they be they develop antibodies toward the influenza virus. Um, of course that's how vaccines work, right? You you get a dose of inactive virus and your body produces antibodies that will hopefully keep you from getting infected with the real one, right, in theory. But, um, but you're right, yeah, there's an adaptation. And so apparently, I'm not an, I'm not an immunologist or an epidemiologist, but um, apparently what happens uh, with viruses like this is sometimes they appear and they're very, very lethal and they'll kill off a lot of people um, but then they'll often mutate to a less strong form. And so viruses are kind of mutating and changing all the time, right? They have a very short, they have a very short lifespan, so you know, generations can happen very quickly. And so sometimes viruses are constantly mutating. And so the thought is, is that this one mutated into a less virulent form, a less contagious or a less deadly form. Because of course, if the virus stays as deadly as it is, eventually it's gonna kill off all its hosts and then it's gonna die too, right? So it's uh, evolutionarily speaking, it's in the virus's best interest not to be so effective, right? Um, but that's what people think happened is that it uh, mutated into a less virulent strain. And so it kind of existed, but it existed as kind of a regular flu that people didn't get too excited about rather than Um, I think that is, I think it's a bacterium. Ooh, don't quote me on that. Yeah, and, and has still popped up in other places since, right? Uh, it's mostly eradicated, but sometimes you see it pop up again. That one I'm not sure about, might be a bacterium, but don't, don't quote me on that. This is the danger of live streaming your class because you know you're <laughs> you have to give answers that people may fact check later. Um, but yeah, people. So this one actually seems to have just gone away um, after a few waves of infection. But as we can probably agree from the stats we just saw, it was very deadly for the few years that it was around. Right, more more so than coronavirus so far, anyway. Um, Okay, so that brings us to that brings us to this um, article that I wanted us to read, and so um, I put it into Microsoft Teams. Um, if you look on Microsoft Teams under um, under files, it's called I think it's called just that. It's called how the Spanish flu compares to COVID, and so what I would like to do, as you might guess, is read the article and then answer these questions, okay? So as you can see here, I've got um, how are these two epidemics or pandemics similar and how are they different? Um, what caused the 1918 epidemic to be so deadly? 
and we've talked about that a little bit, but the article will say some stuff. Uh, and is COVID more or less deadly? Um, number three, what lessons can we actually learn from this, right? Because again, that's the reason we're often told that we're studying history, right? So we can learn the lessons of history. So what's the lesson here, right? Is there something that we could learn from the 1918 Spanish flu? Or is there something that we should have learned, but we didn't, and that we're learning now the hard way? Um, and then finally, is there, is there an argument in here? Is the author making an argument or not? So he might, he might be, I think it's a he, Darren, yeah. He might be, or he might not be. So four questions. Um, again, it's, there's, a, there's 18 pages to this article, but most of them are pictures, so don't, don't panic. It's probably like two or three pages if you just look at the text. It's not that much. Um, so I'll give you some time to read, and then, and then we can talk about it, okay? Okay. Uh, how much time do we need? 20 minutes? Amanda, is that good? Okay.
Okay. Um, okay, so let's, let's talk about this. So as you can see, it's not a long article. Um, lots of primary sources though, right? We've got lots of photographs from the time, some of people, you know, standing out in a wheat field or whatever they're doing with their masks on, which looks like it could have come out of today almost, except for their old timey clothes. Um, <clears throat> we see some signs and some newspaper articles that are all um, primary sources as well, right? Coming to us from the time. Um, but let's, let's talk about this. So how are these two, how are these two sort of disease centered historical events? How are they similar? How's the 1918 Spanish flu and the 2019, 2020 COVID thing? How are they similar? Okay, so we have, yeah, we have two respiratory diseases that have broadly similar symptoms, right? That's, that's definitely true. Rose? Same thing, yeah. So we have a disease that has some similar symptoms, right? They're both deadly, right? They both, they both kill people. That is true. Yeah, so there's, um, there, there's kind of a general reluctance of people to either get the word out about this new disease or, um, or, or to sort of take it seriously maybe even, right? In the early stages anyway. Um, not all countries were like that. Obviously, some countries took it very seriously from the get-go and they're in better shape now for the most part. But uh, Mohammed, what were you going to say? Yeah, they're both, they're both, they're respiratory viruses and they both spread through people's breathing, right? So yeah, they, 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 they transmit in a very similar fashion, right? What else? Right, so there's, there's, uh, there's economic concerns that go along with this as well, right? So people, um, people's, the, the economy of countries and people's personal financial well-being was affected, right? And people had a lot of concerns about that. Um, what else? Yeah, they're both, they're both novel viruses, right? So they just appeared, they're brand new, there's no treatments when they first appear, there's no vaccines, and of course no human being has ever had them before, so people don't have any immunity to them, right? We're very susceptible to diseases that our species has never seen before, right? Um, Rafine says here, actually I'm going to hide this, I'm going to put that in there. Uh, yeah, so, so like COVID, uh, the influenza virus uh, originally outbroke from China and it was dangerous to people with the weaker immune system. So um, definitely COVID did. There, I think there is one of the theories that for the Spanish flu, there is one theory that says that it originated in China as well but I think nobody's quite sure. Um, as you probably read in the article, um, you know, people didn't, pe you know, viruses hadn't even been isolated yet. G governments didn't talk, records weren't being kept. The science was quite a bit, you know, the level of science was lower than it is now. So nobody's quite sure where it comes from. So even though we've managed to trace coronavirus to Wuhan, China, nobody's quite sure where Spanish flu came from. There is one, there is one theory that says that it, that it did originate in China, but I think most of the sources you would probably read say that the first case came from that army base in Kansas. But um, Rafine, you're, you're right. There is a theory that says, um, that says that they both, that that one originated in China as well, but I don't know too much about the origin stories of, uh, of Spanish flu. Um, Dangerous to people with a weaker immune system. Yeah, I would say that's true. Uh, prioritize mask wearing in public. That is true. And yeah, and issuing quarantines to people. So we see some of the same interventions, right? Some of the same interventions for both of these diseases. And uh, Michaela says, um, 
At first, influenza doesn't have any treatment or vaccine since nobody um, encounters such a disease. And the same goes with COVID. Yeah, they're exactly. They're both, um, they're both novel, novel viruses, right? Nobody's really sure how to deal with them yet. Um, other similarities? Right, so Canadians weren't uh, as affected at first, that's true. Um, and particularly f this article, because where's this article kind of coming from? What, what city is it talking about? Winnipeg, yeah, and where's Winnipeg in Canada? Um, a little bit north of here, but it's in, it's in Manitoba, yeah, and roughly where is that in Canada in terms of broadly? It's kind of right in the middle, right? Sorry, this is a geography lesson now. Winnipeg's kind of like right smack in the middle of Canada, right? So it's a little, it's a little bit further north than Vancouver is, if you look at the latitude. Uh, it's definitely a lot colder than, than Vancouver is. Um, but it was right in, in the middle, right? So um, people in Manitoba, people in Winnipeg thought that they were well isolated from this virus because, oh, it's, it's over there, right? The virus is over there, wherever over there is. And they felt insulated because they were right in the middle of Canada. They weren't on the shores or the borders and they were kind of complacent, right? They were initially not too worried. Um, what else? Other similarities? Okay, let's move on to differences. How are, these two, how are these two epidemics or diseases different from each other? What's that? Numbers, numbers yeah. So uh, in terms of the number of affected and the number of people who have died, there's a pretty big difference, right? Of course, Spanish flu is over, so those numbers are set, but we're not really out of this coronavirus thing yet, right? So who knows what's going to happen, but... So far, the numbers for Spanish flu are much greater than, than coronavirus. Um, what else? Differences. Differences. You, yeah, it was, definitely a, 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 it was definitely a more deadly virus. And um, I'm not sure about the, how communicable it was. I'm not sure if it spread more easily than... Um, coronavirus. I don't know if you've if you've been listening to the news or if you've been paying attention. Um, they talk about um, what is it? I forget what they call it, but it's the transmissibility. And so, if you if you get this virus, how many people on average will you infect? The what? The R not. Yeah. How many people will you infect? And so, I think coronavirus is three. Right? I think, it's, I think it's about three people. For the average flu, it's about one, I think, usually. I think for measles, it's like 13 or something like that. So some diseases are far more transmissible and communicable than others. And so, um, but I'm not sure where Spanish influenza falls in that category, maybe. Um, other differences, either in the virus itself or in people's response to it, or just in the conditions of the world at the time. Yeah, we are definitely more medically advanced, right? We know far more about viruses and their treatment and vaccines. We can sequence DNA. I mean, we can do a lot more things 100 years later than people in 1918 could, right? Definitely. Uh, what else? Ayushi says here, uh, there's much better quarantine facility during COVID than Spanish flu. Yeah, we are certainly better at quarantining people, right? And we are better at, well, potentially anyway, and we're better at, um, we're better at, at keeping things sanitary and clean, right? Um, if we choose to. That's true, Ayushi, that's good. What else? Other differences. Uh, yeah, it went on longer so far, right? We'll see. feels like it's been long enough, though, hasn't it? Is everyone, like, over this coronavirus thing? Yeah, I'm... S 
I'm so over it. Um, sorry, yeah, Mohammed. Right. There's uh, our our reporting and record keeping today is much better than than in the past, right? And so I think the article said that in some cases, you know, s some people were keeping good records, some people weren't. Sometimes people were, you know, sometimes churches were keeping records, sometimes hospitals were, sometimes nobody was keeping records. So, it, it, you know, the, the information is not as good as then as it is today, right? Uh, what else? There's another important thing about work, I think, that they mentioned. What did they mention about work? Oh, they said that in, the, in our time, it's more like to close down the non-essential businesses. But back then, people would just go to work and be the trade of, of getting their jobs, and not having enough money to keep them. Yeah, so there were, there were things that we have in Canada today that they did not have. So they did not have universal health care yet. So if you had to go to the doctor and you went to the doctor, he gave you a bill at the end, right? Like you had to pay the doctor in money, right? We don't, we don't do that anymore. We have a universal health care system here. Um, people didn't have trade unions. The labor laws were far less restrictive. And so if you didn't come into work because you were sick, the boss could say, well, what good are you? You're fired. I'll get someone else. So people would continue to come in to work when they were sick because they risked losing their job. Nowadays, you can't do that, right? If somebody takes a sick day, well, they have legally mandated sick days. And if you take a sick day, your employer cannot fire you because you got sick, especially if you get COVID. They cannot, they cannot fire you for that. Um, and we also have... Um, employment assistance, right? So even if you did get fired for some reason, another reason, there's unemployment insurance. You can continue to pay the bills, right? So we have a social safety net, right? We have programs that can give people money if they need it and they're in a difficult situation. At the time, there's none of that. And of course, for coronavirus, we had CERB, right? We had that, what was it called? Coronavirus employment resource benefit or something like that? Is that what it was? But the government gave people money, right? If they couldn't go to work because their business was shut down, the government paid them, right? And so all of that stuff is, none of that stuff exists in 1918. And so if you need to go to the doctor, if you need to pay the doctor, if you need to pay your rent and food, you need to go to work because there's no, there's no social safety net. There's none of those programs. There's churches, who you know may give you a free meal. They're kind of churches were administering charitable programs at the time, or there's your relatives and your family. They might help you out. But other than that, that's it. So people continue to go in to work because there's just no, you know, the government will not save you. And so here in Canada today, to some extent, the government will save you or will help you out. But at the time, that doesn't exist. Um, okay, any other differences? Other differences? Maybe one more. Maybe one more. I'm thinking globally, though. Yeah, so they, they mentioned that the, the World Health Organization, although it has a bit of, um, you know, it has a bit of dirt on its face after, <laughs> after the, the whole coronavirus response, but the WHO doesn't exist in 1918. There is no global body that is sharing information between countries and helping people coordinate a response, right? There's none of that. And so everybody is just dealing with this on their own in a little in a little bubble, right? And so depending on how your country is doing and what your country knows, that might be good or it might not be so good, right? So yeah, kind of different. Th these two viruses are not the same, but they also appear in very different contexts, right? In terms of medical science, 
in terms of populations, in terms of historical events, and in terms of what sort of supports are there if people are sick or if people can't work, right? Okay, time for a break? Yeah, yeah? okay, you guys have been working hard. Time for a break, take 10, we'll come back and we'll keep talking, we'll finish talking about this.
OK, and we're back. So this is a similar but different historical situation, right? We said that there are these two viruses that are appear. They are both novel in that they're brand new. Nobody's ever seen them before. They both happen to be respiratory viruses. They're both spread in a very similar way. People breathing their droplets of virus on you. You gross. Hello. Not you guys. <laughs> um, there, are, there are some similarities here. Um, they're transmitted as people travel around the world. And we said that people are initially, they don't, in many cases, they don't take it that seriously. They think it's not a big deal. They think it's something that's, oh, it's happening over there. We don't have to worry about it over here. Um, but there are also some differences as well, right? And so we said that it's a kind of a different context in terms of medical science and what doctors know about viruses in general. This is a world where there aren't a lot of social supports for people who get sick in Canada or for people who can't work. And so today we have a universal health care system and we have unemployment insurance and we have laws about, you know, you can't fire someone just because they get sick and they can't come to work. Um, we have economic supports, and so again, if you're during COVID, if your business closed um, during that lockdown period, then the government would continue to pay you. None of those things exist in um, in 1918 or 1919, and there's not a lot of information sharing that happens either, right? So governments aren't keeping very good records. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not, sometimes churches are keeping them, and certainly nobody is sharing their information the way that we can today, right? So they don't have an internet um, to spread information, they can't just email each other, and of course there's no global body that's looking after this. So we do have the League of Nations, but we don't have a World Health Organization like we have today, and so um, we are in a much better position, of course, to deal with a novel virus like this than they were in 1918, right? So the question that I have for you is what, what kind of lessons can we, sh can we or should we learn from this? Or can we learn anything at all? Is there anything, is there anything that the 1918 virus can, that we can use to sort of better understand the present or to do things better in the present? What's that? Don't take it lightly, right? So novel, novel viruses can be um, very transmissible and can kill a lot of people, right? Particularly in a world where a lot of people travel around. And so at the end of the war, arguably more people are traveling than normal. But of course, in the world we live in today, or at least the world of six months ago, people flew all over the globe all the time, right? There's planes taking off and landing every few seconds around the world, right? What else can we learn? That there's going to be a second wave. That there's going to be a second wave, right? So we're not, we're not done with this thing yet, uh, especially since we have no really good treatment and we don't have a vaccine. There's, you know, it's going to come again. Why, why is there a second wave in the fall, do they say, of a virus like this? Right, so there are other diseases around too. So we often get um, we often get a wave of just regular influenza at this time of year as well. Um, why is that? Right. People's, people do not remain vigilant, right? They begin to get relaxed about the whole thing or they, um, or they just get tired, right? And I think, are, are we not all kind of feeling that right now? Just like, ugh, I think I said it, I feel like I'm so, I'm so done with this, right? Like I'm so done with this corona thing. I don't want to do it anymore. But of course, you know, nothing has really changed, right? The, the virus is still out there. There's really no treatment for it or vaccine, and so we still have to be cautious, probably for quite some time, right? Which is exhausting, but 
that's, that's what we have to do. Um, what else? What other lessons might we be able to learn or not learn? Like this would have been. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 less because yeah, a lot of the a lot of the lessons that we might learn from this historical event, we've kind of learned them in the present, right? We've learned a lot about oh pandemics and transmissibility and social distancing or physical distancing and quarantining and you know wearing masks and sanitizing and washing your hands and all these things we've kind of been exposed to and now we're kind of looking at it and saying oh yeah this is we've, we've done this before we've had this has happened before a hundred years ago where they dealt with another virus and they learned all these lessons then, right? And so we're kind of learning them, learning them now. That's true. Um, but it does sound very familiar when you read the article, right? It's, it's yeah, there's very, there's, there are a lot of similarities. Um, other lessons that we can learn? No? Okay. What about this last one then? Is there, is there an argument that's being made here? Can we see an argument? Now he's, unfortunately, if there is one, I'm not saying that there is one, but if there is one, it's not really being laid out clearly for us, I don't think. Um, but if you, if, if, this, if, if there was an argument in here, what might it be? What might the conclusion be? Okay, um, I'm just going to put a pin in that for a second because I want to say one more thing and then I'll come back to it. Um, often when an author is making a strong argument, sometimes you can see it in the title. Okay, so sometimes the title will actually tell you what the author is trying to prove or convince you of. And so just as a, just as a quick aside, if we look at the title of this article, does that convince us of anything? Is there anything that we're being asked to strongly believe there? No? I'm, I'm, I'm kind of thinking not either. It's a kind of, uh, yeah, it's not a very strong title, right? It's not trying to convince you of anything, right? The, the Spanish flu compares, how the Spanish flu compares to COVID, lessons learned, answers still being pursued. That doesn't sound very strong, right? It doesn't sound like this is what you should believe doesn't quite sound like that. It doesn't mean there's no argument. It just means that we're not going to get any help from the title here. Okay. Um, okay, so Ahmad, you had two things. You said either, um, what were your two things again? One was that it's... Okay. <laughs> those, are, those are two opposing statements, which is not good for our um, attempt to figure out an argument. Uh, either they're both the same or one is worse than the other. Um, other thoughts? Is there, is there something we're being asked to believe here? This is a bit of a, this is a, bit of a compare and contrast paper, if you will, right? It's a little bit of a, you know, we have two things. They're similar this way. They're different in this way. But is there an argument? OK, who, think, who thinks there definitely isn't an argument? Put up your hand. There's definitely no argument here. OK? You're so reluctant to put up your hands. Like a, nothing, is, nothing bad is going to happen if you are wrong. I promise you. I am wrong several times a day about things. It is not the end of the world. It happens to everybody. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Is there an argument here? No? Who thinks no? No, no, probably not. That looks like a tentative. Amanda? I think there's a point, but I don't know if it's an argument. 
What's his point? Mm. Um, it, okay, I'm going to put a pin in that. I'm going to come back to it. Remember what you just said. So, so no, not sure, or no? 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 Okay. So, Amanda, you said, you said he might have a point in trying to show how similar they are. Um, I think you could be right. I think this is one of, I think you're right. I think you're all right. I think there is no clear, strong argument here. Um, but just like we did those um, examples in critical thinking where we said, um, you know, I, I showed you, you know, the one about the XJ fighter jet and whatever. And I said, you know, there's no argument here, but we could make it into an argument, right, if we add a few things. And so I think this, this article here, could, we could make it an argument if we took one side or the other. If we said, you know, there are a lot of differences between Spanish flu and COVID, but, you know, there are some very strong similarities that we should pay attention to. And those similarities are boom, 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 right? Three things or something. Similarly, you could take the other side and say, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of similarities between Spanish flu and COVID, but they're really different. This is a really different thing. And here's why. Boom, boom, boom. So I think the author could have taken either one of those sides and turned this article into something with a strong argument. So it's, it's possible to do. Um, but I don't know that he's necessarily done that. I think he said, yes, they're somewhat the same. Yes, they're somewhat different. I guess we'll see what happens. <laughs> that seems to be his... Um, that seems to be his approach in this article. And so I don't think he has a strong argument. It's a bit of a compare and contrast. And that's kind of it, right? It's, 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 it's an article for information purposes and to sort of show some similarity and difference. But I don't know that he's trying to strongly convince us of one thing or another. But he could, right? If he rewrote this in a different way, organized things in a different way, I think he could take one side or the other, right? Um, yeah, what do you think about that? Do you, do you agree? Do you kind of see that? Yeah, I, th I think so too. That's, that's my read of it. Um, and, and the other thing that's nice too is that when sometimes when you have an article with a strong argument, they will tell you what the argument is right out of the, right out of the gate, right at the beginning, so that you can so that you know what to expect, right, as they go through it. But here, I, I don't really see that. And, you know, I, I think it's just an article for information purposes, right, to sort of compare the two. And that's kind of, that's kind of it. That's what he's doing. And that's okay. But, um, okay, anything else we should say about Spanish flu before we go on? Or COVID? No? Um, <clears throat> Either way, you know, maybe the last thing we should say is that we, we're just going to have to stay vigilant. We're going to have to keep washing and sanitizing and masking up and just, you know, sucking it up till this thing is, is over, right, eventually. Um, especially in the winter months because we'll be inside more. Although luckily we live in a pretty warm climate, at least for Canada. Sorry, I know, I know some of you are from warmer climates, but... In terms of Canada, this is as good as it gets, I promise you. So, um, <laughs> Eliana's like, really? It's true. This is the best weather. This is the best weather in Canada. Yep. Oh, you were in Winnipeg. When, when were you in Winnipeg? Two months ago. Two months ago? Oh, okay. Well, that was nice then. Except for the mosquitoes, right? It was very cold? Oh, during winter. Yeah, it's freezing during winter. Yeah, this is, you're, you're going to be, Mohammed, you're going to be very happy with the climate here. It's, it's going to be a little cool and a little wet, but it's not going to be Winnipeg grade, you know, iceberg freezing stuff. Although, Ahmad, I know you're into that, but that's okay. Um, all right, so we did that, did we not? We did. 
Oh yeah, I had a little video. Maybe I'll come back to that tomorrow. Okay, I'll come back to the, the, the video tomorrow, but I'll just say, no, I won't. Will I? No, let's watch the video. Um, so, I think it's a five minute video. So people online, um, I'm going to, I'm just gonna post the link for you in Microsoft Teams so you can watch it. And then we'll just watch the video and then we'll come back and talk about it. So just give me 10 seconds here to get my technology organized. All right, so for online people, the video is posted in Microsoft Teams, and we'll take five minutes and watch it, and then I'll see you back here. Um, yeah, I'll see you back here in just five minutes. Maybe I'll put a counter up too. And then we'll watch it here in class. Okay.
So just a couple things to point out. Number one, of course, that you know this is a, the legacy of World War One is a couple of things. Number one, they talk about this idea of, I guess, militarism, right? Where in World War One the industrial sort of revolution that originally occurred to be able to produce goods faster and more efficiently, that machinery gets made to make machinery of war, right? And those, the, those new war technologies are more effective than they've ever been. And of course, that trend will continue, right? And if you look at the US today, the US spends massive amounts of money on its military, right? Either strengthening it or constantly developing new weapons. And of course, they're not the only country that is engaged in this sort of thing, but it really starts in World War I, where um, countries devote significant resources trying to figure out how to have military power, how to more efficiently kill people or at least make other people scared that you will, right? And that, that kind of starts in World War I. But this, these historians also point out this kind of legacy of failure, right? Because, because the, you know, the whole point of that Treaty of Versailles was to make sure that this thing never happens again and that maybe, maybe we can end wars permanently, right? And I kind of chuckled a little bit as, ha ha, that, that, didn't, that didn't work in any way, right? We not only did wars not come to an end, but they had another massive conflict um, 20 years later, right? And so 20 years, everybody really should have remembered what happened the first time. But again, some of the same mistakes get made, some brand new mistakes get made, and we have yet another conflict, right? And so there were lessons to be learned from World War I and from Treaty of Versailles that people didn't really learn very well, right? Uh, and finally, he points out something that's um, interesting as well as the role of the federal government. And so for countries like the U.S. and Canada before World War I, um, federal governments were really small. And so the federal government dealt with, um, you know, sort of foreign policy, how we interacted with other countries. They set tariffs and things like that. But that was kind of it. Um, the federal government was really quite small. But through the course of World War I, federal governments have to become larger and more powerful in order to organize the resources of the entire country to win the war. And we've talked about that already, right? And so coming out of World War I for both the US and for Canada, they have a much bigger federal government than they used to have. And as we'll see, those governments will continue to get bigger and sort of more involved in people's lives um, through the 1930s and then into the 1940s. So there's a bit of a, um, there's a, bit of a political change there that happens. Um, yeah, there's a bit of a political change that happens there. Um, okay, so tomorrow, tomorrow we will talk about um, the legacy, a little bit of legacy of World War I. We'll talk a little bit about, um, a little bit about the 1920s and maybe the 1930s. So before you go, I just want to reiterate, um, for the quiz on Friday, I will hand you a paper quiz in here, okay? Online people, I'll deal with you separately, so don't worry. Um, people who are here, I will give you a paper quiz. There'll be about, I don't know, three to five questions. I'll see how much. Um, the questions won't be very long, so you won't have to write a lot. What? You won't have to write very much. Um, I, can, I, I will make sure all the lecture slides are posted and we'll probably make them maybe up until, okay, I'll say up until today, okay? So nothing after today's class will be on the quiz, all right? Um, I'll make sure all the lecture slides are posted and I get to ask you anything that's in my lecture slides and any question from a book or article that we've read, okay? So I won't ask you a question that I haven't already asked you, so, um, but if I, you know, the, one of the questions I asked you about the article today, I get to ask you that again, but I won't ask you random details out of nowhere because that's not fair. Um, cool? 
Um, I don't know, 25 minutes or so. It shouldn't take, I'll, I'll do it in a way that it shouldn't take you very long and then you don't have to write, you know, a ton of stuff for me, okay? So it, it, shouldn't, take, it shouldn't take that long. I'll give you the time that you need within reason, but it, it shouldn't take you that long to do. Okay? Cool, cool, cool? Cool, cool. Okay, that is it. Online people, good work today. I will see you tomorrow.